Good, good. Thanks for coming out. Uh, the time is now 11 o'clock. Uh, obviously, you're all here to meet Debbie Derryberry, because that's the name of the panel. Uh, so without further ado, I will introduce Miss Derryberry and have her come up on stage. I guess it's just me up here so I can take this down. Yes. Well, thanks for getting up early. It's not really early, is it? How many of you guys have been here for the entire con? Wow. How many just today? Excellent. So glad to see you. Can you hear me okay? Oh, good. Well, Chris, how do we start this thing, meet me? Well, who's Chris? <laughs> Chris, Tim, Sam. His name's Tam, Tim, Tim. but I, miss, I mix up Ryan and Kyle. I mix up Tim and Chris and a few others, Tony and Peter. I mix those up, don't know why. Do you guys have that in your brains where two names just, they can't get them straight? No? Okay, thanks, I feel dumb. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, some corroboration. <laughs> so now I just call him all the names at once. Tim, Chris, Sam. Yes, yes. So, thanks for coming out, everybody. Uh, obviously, we're here to meet Miss Derryberry, and uh, let's just uh, jump right into it. So, Debbie. I'm gonna tell you anything you wanna know about me today. Anything, just kidding. Yesterday, you told us that you did not intend to become a voice actor. And I did us. not intend to become a voice actor. What do you guys want to hear? How I got into voice acting? That part? Okay. Um, I've always been a singer, and I started my acting career when I was eight years old in community theater. And I got my first guitar when I was nine or ten and started playing and writing songs and singing, and harmonies always made me super happy and doing theater made me happy, and doing gymnastics made me happy, so I did all those things, and <clears throat> knew that I couldn't make a living doing music or acting, so I uh, went to UCLA, because uh, I lived, I grew up in the desert near Palm Springs, California, in Indio. You guys heard of Coachella? It's like a festival. Well, that was our high school rival. Nobody knew what Coachella was back then. Now they do, but no one still knows what Indio is. It's the little town next to Coachella. So um, went to straight to UCLA and majored in pre-med, and I was ready to go to medical school, and I would spend my weekends uh, busking, just playing your guitar on the streets in Westwood, which is a little city by at UCLA. and decided I'd move to Nashville and so to go, instead of going med to medical school, my dad was thrilled. Thrilled. <laughs> Very supportive, dad though. Was not thrilled. <laughs> and um, luckily, it was just one good thing after another when I got to Nashville and got my first TV series there. I've played a lot of probably more boys on television in costume than anything else. I've done a few grown up and human roles, but mostly like that role I booked on uh, Hey Vern, It's Ernest. It was a like a Pee Wee Herman show type thing. It was a kid's show on Saturday morning and somebody saw me in a play doing To Kill a Mockingbird at Tennessee Rep and just put me in the TV show and I thought, I can do that. So I dressed up as a boy clown, a 12-year-old boy clown, and did 13 episodes of a kid's show and got in Screen Actors Guild, and I was able to stop waiting tables after waiting tables for so many years. I think all actors should wait tables. Actually, I think all people should wait tables because it really gives you a, an appreciation um, we need to be really nice to our serving staff because our serving staffs work hard. I always appreciate that now that I've done it. It's not easy, not easy at all. So yeah, I was able to quit waiting tables and um, then I continued with body double work, they call it. My agent said, well, we want you to go body, body double these, uh, Jim Varney's doing another movie called Ernest Goes to Camp. 
in the forest. So I went out to the forest with my little, we had these electric typewriters then, it was before iPhones, and I thought I was so cool with my electric typewriter and I could write songs and didn't need to plug in. And so I, um, I took it with me and one of the moms of one of the boys said, you should try voiceover or cartoons. And I didn't know that cartoons had voices. I thought Fred Flintstone was Fred Flintstone. I just had no idea it was a thing. So uh, she gave me names of casting directors in Los Angeles, and I had written to many of them on my typewriter in the forest, and said, I'm Debbie Derryberry, and I think I should do cartoons, and here's my cassette demo. And I mailed them in the mail, and uh, they all wrote me back, and Ginny McSwain wrote back, she was working at Marvel at the time, and said, really good voice, cute, but you have to live in LA. So I quickly got divorced and moved back to LA. <laughs> and she hand, hand held me and walked me into uh, ICM, and uh, I followed that agent to DPN for I guess 18 years. I started booking cartoons after two weeks and it was like I never planned on it, but I always say when doors open for you, you should just run through them because you never know when a door is gonna open. It, it happens at the weirdest times, but you have to be on guard and recognize it because those are your opportunities. And that was my opportunity, her telling me have you thought about voiceover? No, I think I shall think about it. Here are some names. Okay, I shall write to them. Um, you need to live in LA, on my way. <laughs> um, it's at least four doors, guys. What? <laughs> That's at least four doors you ran through. I got four doors open for me, but there have always been uh, doors maybe I didn't realize that that's what they were. But I think when we recognize that something, I just don't think there's any uh, reason to hesitate because someone else might run in a, ahead of you. So I've been really fortunate. I had something else cool I wanted to tell you, but I'll think of it. Did you have a question? Come on up. If you guys have questions, I could just blab about me all day. So please get in line. I'd rather, you know, answer what you want to know about. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, sorry, I'm just going to... A few guidelines for the questions. If it is, um, if you're going to ask what her favorite role is, all of them are her favorite. <laughs> so let's try to avoid questions like that because there's just so many different roles and so many different things that Debbie's done that she can't pick between them. All right. Thank you, Tim, Chris, Sam. <laughs> hi, I'm Ryan. I'm hi. sorry, Kyle. Oh, oh. hi, Ryan, Kyle. <laughs> Um, so my question is, do you recall your worst experience as a waitress? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't what I did, it's what I saw. Um, there was one person in the restaurant I was working at in Westwood at a pizza place and this one waitress we called them waitresses and waitresses back then, not servers. She was nasty. She did not like people. And this one table was given her grief and she was serving their waters and they were being, granted they were obnoxious and mean. She spit in it. She stirred it up and she served it back to them. So um, another reason to be kind to your servers. <laughs> Again, I didn't do it nor I, ne I never have, but I saw it happen firsthand. It was so gross. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. You're welcome, Kyle Ryan. Hello. Hi, what's your name? Rachel. Rachel, hi. Hi. Um, I just would like to know if you have a favorite Disney movie, and if so, why? A favorite Disney movie, and so why? Uh, no. <laughs> I like a lot of them that I'm in. Um, I did work on... Uh, a Miyazaki film called Kiki's Delivery Service a long time really? ago. I played the, the bitch witch, oh, <laughs> the I senior witch that. who like flies along with Kiki and says mean things. 
And uh, that was a, a fun movie. It was quick. You know, you go into this big Disney soundstage and do your part, and then they um, sometimes in these they call them looping sessions or uh, incidental role sessions. Sometimes they need you to uh, create sounds for the other principal actors, like because when the principal uh, Kirsten Dunst is recording her lines, they don't always know what the animators are gonna do. I mean, obviously they knew because the Miyazaki film was already made, but they had forgotten to get it, like her running or breathing or tripping. So I, uh, I breathed for Kirsten Dunst a lot. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and The Senior Witch, that was a super fun film. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, my question for you is, what was it like being Dracula? Well, when we first started, uh, they didn't, um, they don't always tell you the name of the project or what it's gonna be, and it was another Mattel project, and they called it uh, Meadow Hearts. So I went to audition for Meadow Hearts, and the audition was this long paragraph of, hi, my name is Yakety Schmackety, and I like this and this and this. And it went on and on, and they said she's kind of, um, uh, they call it a mid-European accent. So I put my Transylvanian or Russian accent on it, and they said, she talks very fast. So I thought, okay, she talks fast, she's tiny, so I took the voice up high. Um, and then when they cast me at it, oh, wait, I'm gonna burp. Oh, it wasn't a good one. I'll get to that in a minute. When we're recording, uh, they need you to burp on cue, and I can't, so I always tell my engineer, you know, keep a track running and I'll give you my burps, and then you'll have them when you need them, when the character burps. Uh, so I feel like I should burp into any microphone, even though they're not recording me. Anyway, so uh, recording Monster High, uh, we got to do it as a group. Me and, and Sally Safiotti and Kate Higgins and whoever else was in it, O.G. Banks and Cam Clark. And we went over to Salami Studios, which is just down the street, because we all live right there in North Hollywood, Burbank area. So this was way before pandemic, obviously. So you didn't have to drive very far to get to work. And uh, I remember the director, Audu Patton, was, uh, he really liked things a certain way. So maybe one line, I might have to do 20 takes on that one line to get it just right. So those first, 20 episodes or so, I would say he was just very particular. And then we had another, the guy who started recording it down at Mattel, um, down, by, down, the, down by LAX, which was kind of a drive. His name was Scott Pactor, and um, he was awesome, and he just passed away this year. I miss him very much, Scott. Um, that would make me cry but super fun recording, and also fun to work with Sally Safiotti, who did both Claudine and, help me out? Frankie. Think, not Frankie. Uh, Cleo. Thank you, Cleo. Cleo and Claudine. And she could switch back and forth, like Rob Paulson, for those characters. So yeah, memorable and fun show. And then when we finally got to know, know what it was called, Monster High, then um, it all came together and it became clear. But yeah, very evasive these and elusive, the uh, big companies, you know, Mattel, they don't let out the information at once. Here's a tiny piece of information. Do your best. <laughs> yeah, I was also the Danny with the mask that says Debbie. Oh, thank you, that's you? That was me, yes. Oh, you look so different. Thank you, I'm in different thank cosplay. Thank you so much. That's the best, that was the best moment yesterday to see that lighted up, up on your mask. It said um, my name right on her mask. I felt so famous, thank you. <laughs> Hi, what's your name? My name is Liz. Hi, Liz. Oh, thank you, this is my fabulous husband bringing me coffee. Thank you, darling. <laughs> Everybody say, thank you, Ian. Thank, thank you, Ian. I like your shirt. Which one is he wearing today? Guild Wars 2. Guild Wars 2, right, that really sparkles. <laughs> I don't wear a lot of t-shirts, so I just pass them over to Ian. <laughs> so far, he's got a, a lot of t-shirts. <laughs> see, what did you wear yesterday? Boffo, 
Tigtone. You wore Tigtone yesterday. Does anybody watch Tigtone? If you don't, thank you for watching it. It is such a silly little show. What's it on again? HBO. It was a Cartoon Network Adult Swim show, and now it's on HBO, but it's T-I-G-T-O-N-E, and it's a mixture of like, kind of like Game of Thrones cartoon meets rolled doll, and it's written very weirdly, and I play Tigtone as this superhero kind of quest maker, and I play his uh, helper sidekick named Helpy, who's this purple monster, and he can pull off his arms and legs and use them as weapons, and then he regenerates. So I'm always helping him on his quests, and that was a cool voice, because it sounds like it would hurt me, but it doesn't. Here, uh, takes me a second. <laughs> I am, hi, wait. I'm Helpy. There he is. Hi, I'm Helpy. I like to help. Where are we going next, Tigtone? <laughs> so you guys watch that for me, okay? You will love it. I watch it and I'm like, really? That's me? Hi. Hi. So hearing that you, si that you sang is amazing because I love singing. Yeah. So do you still sing at all? Sing at all? I do. I have a band called um, Honey Pig, and I've had it for about 20 years. There's been a few different iterations, but it's a three-part female harmony chick kind of band, and I play guitar, and most of the songs are my own. Um, I think you can see it on honey underscore pig underscore music. Um, I have a couple albums out for that, but I also do preschool music. I have three award-winning preschool albums, and it's all on Spotify, Apple, Pandora, the whole works. And in fact, I had uh, one of my songs went to number one on XM Sirius. It's called Baby Banana. And uh, <laughs> so if you guys have preschoolers or if you just like preschool music, you can look up Debbie Derryberry and see all my music online. And we're getting ready to release a new single in the next month. Just so many steps to releasing a single. But yeah, music is my passion. I still love it. My husband plays bass it's and my he's passion in the band. Too. What? It's my passion too. Isn't it awesome? I have a theater degree, so. Oh, perfect. What kind of music do you play? Oh my goodness. All kinds. Excellent. Do you have I, a band? I do musical theater. Oh, that's so fun. Good for you. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Hi there. Hi. Great Debbie. costume. Thank you. I don't Thank really play video today. games. Who is it? I'm Gianna, and I'm cosplaying as Free Justine <laughs> from Fairy Tale. Okay. And well, I have a question for you. I would just wear that raincoat <laughs> just because it's cool. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Here's my question. As much as I love you voicing as Coco Bandicoot, how is your experience voicing as Diana in Sailor Moon? <laughs> Um, that was a, in voiceover, some, we call it um, when someone just throws you a bone. Um, my girlfriend who uh, engineers over at Studiopolis uh, called. She says, Debbie, I just, get in here. I just need you to do a cat. I said, okay. And I uh, just ran over to Studiopolis and I did this one off on a cat. And she's like, no, this is Diana. Her name's Diana. I said, okay. And then I um, started paying attention. I'm like, oh, this is a big deal. People really like this show a lot, and I get to be Diana, and I didn't realize it was such a big deal. And um, so I'm really like honored, and I think I should have been a little less uh, cocky <laughs> <laughs> when I first got that role, because I'm really proud of doing it now. I never record with anyone else, because it's uh, anime, and in anime, we all go, the picture's been done for years already, so you go into the booth, they have a monitor, um, you get to see the action, and you see the words next to it, and it's a whole different part of voiceover doing anime, because you have to learn the dance pretty quickly, and get in this groove with your director, and it has to match the lip flaps, and the director has to like have permission to rewrite if there's too many things going on with the lip flaps and they don't match the words. So you have to look at the line, let your mouth do the line, look up to the words, match it, and then stick your acting in it too. And with Diana, she's never 
really effervescent. I think the the little things with Diana are because in between lines she'll jump up or jump down or be running. So there's all these little uh, hi or you know <laughs> that go along with the lines. Uh, but I think she's just adorable, and I'm so surprised how many fans there are here at this particular con for Diana. She's really cute, isn't she? Yes, I agree. You sound adorable, sir. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm glad it. you took the opportunity and went with it. You Sorry, I, ca I can't hear you. Well, I'm glad you took the opportunity and went with it. Because sometimes what did you, say? you just got to roll the punches. Yeah, I still can't hear you. <laughs> And ran with it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, You're I'm welcome. glad I took the opportunity and ran with it, too. Yep. I shall Some, continue. And sometimes you got to roll the punches. Yep, and run through the doors that open. <laughs> and don't be cocky. <laughs> and fight for love and justice. Thanks. Good job. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Hi, my name is Angel. Um, and uh, Zatch Bell is like one of my favorite animes ever. And um, I just wanted to know, like, what, like, you know, how was it, you know, being the voice of Zatch for the English dub? Well, we never really know how things are going to go when we start voicing them. So I auditioned, and uh, my challenge was to make sure he stayed far away from Jimmy Neutron, which I obviously didn't do a very good job of. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought I'll give him this, you know, signature laugh that Jimmy doesn't do. So uh, Jeff and I, Jeff Nimoy, the director, who, yes, is related to Leonard Nemo by being a cousin somewhere down the line. And uh, so Jeff and I kind of spent a few minutes coming up with that, <laughs> that thing. And, you know, when he first came, he was naked. And they decided they didn't want naked Zatch, so they drew a little sailor dress on him. And um, that's how I always knew him, but they told me he was naked at the beginning. Um, I think some of the Xeno sessions were harder because he, I, I gave him a voice I shouldn't have given him because I, I, it was bad for me to do that. I don't know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like raspy. So there weren't a whole lot of uh, bad sessions like that, but usually I gave my voice a day rest after Xeno sessions. But Zatch was pretty easy, and I think um, the guy who played um, my buddy, uh, what's his name? You. Yeah, he drove in from uh, Arizona every week, which is a long way if you don't know. It was probably like an eight or nine hour drive. He had to drive in to record his sessions for that. But it was over at um, another location of Studiopolis. I love those people at Studiopolis. So it was great. I wish they had finished it because I have to incur the wrath of all the fans who are like, why didn't you finish it? It wasn't my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Was that it? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi. How um, are you? I'm great. How are you, like, how are you feeling? Cold. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's mood. cold. I have my coffee. Thank you, Ian. But um, my my question is, it's funny that you actually mentioned Jimmy because my question was, um, I've always wondered, do you, as you're playing Timey in Guild Wars, have you kind of like embraced that energy that Jimmy had, just specifically because she's like all like that the brains of the operation of the pact, you know, like of the group. That's it's really interesting that you say that because yes, she's a genius. But when I was auditioning for her, they give you the character's breakdown. And I have a niece who, at the time, was in her late teens. And she's so um, teenager-y. And um, I love her to death. But I thought, I have to inhabit her for this character. So I always hear her in my head for the emotion of timing. Mm -hmm. But the smart part, it's nice that it's, you know, that they think of me and cast me on smart characters because I can say those big words. Although I could say Jimmy's lines a lot easier than 
Chinese lines. I mean, those are words I've never heard of. I thought ley lines was like a new thing, but apparently it's not a new thing. And she says um, a lot, you know, in video games, they make up all these different places and words and I have to work on them for a while to get my mouth to say it. I remember one time during Jimmy Neutron, I thought it'd be a really good idea to put Botox in my lip. And that was the day that we had to do a dinosaur episode where he had to say all the dinosaur names, like and my lip didn't work. <laughs> I shall never get Botox in my lip again, or anywhere now, it doesn't really help anymore. <laughs> but yeah, um, Timey and Jimmy are both geniuses, but I really had a different place I came from, from my teenage niece. It's, it's always just been a question for me because we, me and the group that I play with in Guild Wars, we've always had this inside joke that she just comes up and she's like, Commander, I just had a brain blast. <laughs> and like, because she just has that, that energy and then obviously yeah. linking the characters mm -hmm. together. But like, I, yeah, I, I adore your role as Timey. Thank she's you. a place in my heart. Thanks so but, much. But thank I you. wish I met more Timey fans because it's a special breed like you that loves oh, Timey. I and when they love her. them, they love it. Thank you. Yes, but thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name's Joseph. Hi again, Joseph. I think we met yesterday. We did. Was it the flannel? Was it the or, or the mask? Uh, the flannel. I think it was the flannel. Oh. <laughs> no. no, it was the mustache. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, that was a COVID joke, you guys. <laughs> I love it. Um, my question is um, because, as I told you uh, yesterday, um, as a Jimmy Neutron fan as a kid, but also as a modern day F is for Family fan, I, want, I was curious about what was your, um, what's your experience with the difference between the two? Because you, you obviously had like, a lot of work, like, like voice roles in between Jimmy Neutron and F is for Family. But how would you describe the difference between those shows? Just like they're obviously like one's an adult comedy and one's, you know, for Nickelodeon. And um, and how would you also uh, describe, um, or from your experience, the um, kind of this generational differences? Like maybe Jimmy Neutron fans have also discovered F is for Family, and now it's this like whole just togetherness, maybe or something like that. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the specific question. The difference that I feel between like a Jimmy Neutron cartoon and the F is for Family. Um, <clears throat> well, when we did uh, Jimmy Neutron, we recorded all at once. And of course, the scripts were very G-rated and very um, uh, not based in reality as much because, you know, there's magic, there's a science that really isn't science. There's you know, flying and talking dogs and idiot dads, and um, and it was all together. And with F is for Family, it was. I mean, obviously, there's things that wouldn't happen in real life, but it's more based in reality because it's sort of Bill's Bill Burr's life growing up, and things that we've all experienced, not all of us, uh, people who are older, like your first answering machine, like there was a time before cell phones, right? And our first answering machines, um, things like the things parents used to do without thinking, drinking beer in the car, putting the infant in the seat when they drive, and that really happened, and these are things he really remembered, and because it was a, <coughs> uh, uh, and it, not Adult Swim because it was a Netflix uh, and you knew it was uh, adult based, you had to be prepared for all the wonderful cursing that went along with it. And Bridget wasn't in the first season. Maureen was and that's what I auditioned for is my very comfortable little girl voice and that's the one they liked. So I'm like I can do Maureen all day because she lives inside me and then in that contract, in the um, streaming contract, they don't pay you per voice. They pay you a contract. So they get as many voices out of you as they want. So they took it, as many as they could get. So <laughs> by the end of season five, is that how many seasons we did? Yes. 
I was doing Maureen, Bridget, who curses like a sailor, as you know, and that's something you'd never hear in Jimmy Neutron, and uh, Kitty, the little kid in the diapers, and Philip, Philip, who sometimes plucks his eyebrows and says, hot oh, cross buns, hot oh, cross buns, and um, oh, the nurse uh, in the hospital, which kid did you kill this time? And um, Gert, the friend Gert with the glasses, you know, the one that the mom went to college with, her. And I also stunt read for Alice and Janney uh, for the mom of, oh, one of the moms. Oh, the Tupperware lady. Uh, oh. Well, I did the stunt reading for, wait, I did the uh, stunt reading for the, that lady, the Tupperware lady, and put it in the garage. Put it in the garage, that's what it was. And uh, they played my line for Alice and Jenny, and then when I heard it recorded, she had said garage exactly how I had said it in the stunt read. So I pat myself on the back for that. I also did, um, the new baby when the baby came, and also Vic's baby when Vic's babies came, and also every one of the babies in the, uh, the little baby play gym. So I layered so many babies. Uh, and Sc Scott, the little uh, kid on the bicycle in the computer club. Scott, come on, get on the bike, let's go. Right in the parade, that guy. So I think I have about eight, nine, 10 characters in that show. Um, <laughs> There are a few things we're not allowed to say in Nickelodeon cartoons. Can't say geez, God. Um, like we're so used to saying, oh my God. Voice actors just don't say that because when you're excited, you have to have another standby thing to say like, oh my gosh, or no way. Because if you say, oh my God, then you ruin the take. And what if somebody else was on the take? Then you've ruined a really good take because you said things you can't say. You can say a lot of things that would surprise you, but you can't say um, a few things like any brand names. You know, you can't say Coke, Kleenex, <laughs> but you can, uh, um, if, it's, if it's an adult one, you can say, I just don't know how many kids are in here. I just don't know what I can do. I'm looking around. Bad words. <laughs> I don't know if that answered the question or not. Uh, it was my bad. It was um, I was trying to like word the question in my head because I love both cartoons and I just love your your performances in both of them. Thank you. And I'm not sure like you did bring up a good point. You're like we don't know how many kids are in here, but if you had to pick a clean favorite quote from F is for Family, what would it be? If I had to pick a clean what? A quote from F is for Family, what would it be? Like line. <laughs> You're asking me a favorite. <laughs> I like them all. <laughs> Sorry. There's just so many of them floating in my head. I'm like, I'm a schizophrenic in here. There's tons of lines floating around. I like when Maureen says, Does that mean I can't be your princess anymore? <laughs> and I like Kenny when he says, uh, you gonna eat this here cocktail weeder? When he's holding the firecracker. <laughs> There's a lot. And of course, Philip is ripe with things to say. Yeah, uh, like, I always love this first line, like, can Billy come out and play? Like, What'd you say? Like, his first line when he's in the cul-de-sac and he's like, uh, can Billy come out and play? And yeah, can Billy come out to play? <laughs> thank a, you. You're welcome. Th and thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So Sonic. <laughs> oh, you, you know that one, right? <laughs> um, I'm back with a new question. Okay. Um, I'm here with the same answers. <laughs> <laughs> Like when you were playing Jimmy Neutron, um, like for Jimmy, like we all know that he is a genius, but he is also a boy, hence the title of the show, Boy Genius. <laughs> and um, even though he's really, 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 really smart academically, he also has to deal with the challenges of being a boy, like um, dealing dealing with uh, going to school with other students, um, being a good friend, dealing with girls, especially Cindy. 
and the fact that he, I guess he can't find the time to pick up a pair of pants. <laughs> I mean, that whole episode could have been avoided if he just found the, took a few seconds out of his time to just right? pick up a piece of clothing. <laughs> but uh, my question was like, gearing towards the saying like, no matter how smart you are from an academic standpoint, the best teacher you can have is life itself. I was wondering if you agreed with that. Oh yeah, I mean, everybody has to go through life, right? So everybody has to pick up social skills and we don't always uh, grow at the same rate socially, especially I think during pandemic. I feel like, um, like I forgot how to talk around people. Do any of you feel like that? You've been locked up on your own so much that you're like, I don't know what to say when I get face to face with people. But yeah, I think Jimmy struggled with trying to be cool and still knowing the right thing to do. And like, I love the Christmas episode. He was like, but where's your proof? He's like, he just can't grasp on to that there's a Santa Claus and he's never gonna believe there's a Santa Claus because you can't scientifically prove it. And it was really hard for him, but he didn't want to feel like an outcast because all his friends believed in Santa Claus. So yeah, he struggled. That was one of my that was one of my favorite episodes actually because of that fact that yeah, he's a genius, but he also need he he also learns how to you know have fun like just be a be a kid, be a boy. I think he could be with <laughs> Sheen and Carl mm -hmm. because Carl is um, he idolizes Jimmy, and Sheen is never really there to start with, right? He's always <laughs> off with with his action figures. Yeah, uh, I think they alert. really do love him and like him. And he's in himself when he's around his boys. But when he's around everybody else, you know, when he gets around Nick or the girls, he fumbles like the rest of us. And uh, it, we, we're good, for, Ian and I are good friends with the producer, uh, John Davis, who created Jimmy. And a lot of it is, is his life growing up and maybe how he felt. And you know, obviously he's grown up now and he's super cool, but when we're growing up and we're in with the school crowd, kids are not nice. Kids should have to wait tables. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I also liked it because I had to deal with that growing up too, so I yeah. related to Jimmy. Totally. I think aspect. all of us have. Uh, I think all of us have felt insecure. Even you think, oh, that one person in school, they're so cool and confident. They're not. Everybody has insecurities. And I think Jimmy just, uh, he dealt with it the best way he knew how. And hopefully he let his audience know that you're not alone. Yeah, he has an amazing brain, but he still struggles. It's hard. You, you're around all these people who seem all confident and seem to know what's going on and they're all, you know, hip and popular, but they go home and they're just as insecure as anybody else. So you just have to love who you are. You guys have to embrace who you are and feel confident and know that you can lead a conversation and a group and walk down the, the street proudly just like anybody else. Nobody's better than you. Yep. That's what I was hoping you'd say, so thank you. <laughs> Good, thanks for the question. That's why I always liked his boy side more than his genius side. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm tying my, tying my shoe, hi. Hi. I'm just tying my shoe down here. I can hear you though, you can do your question. Um, the only one question that I wanna ask is when Jimmy Neutron's robot dog, how was that perfectly made? How was what? Jimmy Neutron's is do uh, robot dog. How was that made? How was it made? Yeah. I'm just gonna put my shoe up here and tie it. You mean the voice or the actual dog? The actual dog. With animators? <laughs> that was a um, you mean how did Jimmy make Goddard? Yeah. The ha, that's the dramatic license they never have to share with us. I think what he did is he got some aluminum cans and he put the Ferranarin in the Synaponoma and then he said the magic words and he stuck it in the Dog Maker 5000 and said and out came Goddard and then they hired Frank Welker and he came alive. 
and he poops screw, screw, screws, right? <laughs> I wish I knew how he made half the things he made. Honest to God, he just, ooh, I said, God, honest to goodness. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question any better. Maybe you can tell me. Yeah, I think that was the only question that I had. <laughs> Good one. I do love Goddard. I like at the beginning where um, they're singing the song. Um, this is a theme song from Jimmy Neutron. And then he goes, ah, 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 ah. There. Hi. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, Debbie. How uh, are you? I'm doing all right. Sorry. Okay. I'm a really nervous, big fan of yours. Thank you. Special. Don't be nervous. It's just me. Oh. I should be nervous. Look at me up here all by myself. Oh. <laughs> so, Debbie, I actually had a major question I wanted to ask, especially on your iconic role from Jimmy Neutron. I wanted to ask, how, does it, how was the entire feeling of actually starting with a new character, especially Jimmy Neutron, with a movie instead of a normal TV show? That must have been, like, daunting or, like, really, like, crazy and big to actually start a new character with a movie instead of the normal pilot show or TV show? How, what was going through your head? Well, you guys wouldn't know this because when it comes to you, it's already a feature film or a cartoon series. But when it comes to us as actors, it came to me as a seven minute interstitial, uh, Johnny Quasar. Mm. And that was the audition. And I go on lots of auditions. So I just showed up the audition and did my best and did my boy voice that I was so insecure about. Because, you know, I was up against the biggies. Everybody at that audition was already a boy's voice. E.G. Daly and Chris Kavanaugh and Nancy Cartwright and, and Pam Adlin. That wasn't her name at the time. but um, And Tara hadn't even come to town yet. So oh, maybe she had. In any case, I just auditioned like I do, and then I go home and forget about it. And so they told me I booked Johnny Quasar and the little interstitial, and that's what it was. When they finished it, they sent it to me eight months later, and I thought, that's pretty cute. Mm. And then they said, we're going to do a movie. They didn't say, we're going to do an Oscar-nominated feature film. They said, we're going to do a movie. There's lots of kinds of movies, you know, made for TV movies. Maybe it's a flop. So. I went in to do the movie, and we record features by ourselves. So I only saw, you know, the big celebrities on the way in and out of the studio, and it was exciting. I think I told the group yesterday, seeing Patrick Stewart and the other <coughs> celebs involved in the project, that was exciting. But I'm just the actor, really. We're just the actors. Oh, I'm going to burp. Are you ready? <laughs> All right, edit that out of post. <laughs> Can you burp on cue? How many of you can burp on cue? Put it on your resume. That's a good one. <laughs> I wish I could. So I, I didn't know. You never know. And then they said it's going to be a cartoon series. You know, you don't know until it comes out. And I still don't feel like, and I'm, I'm really happy that everyone loves Jimmy Neutron and that I get to be his voice. But for me, it was just, you know, going to Nickelodeon every, twice a week and doing fun things. And I, I mean, you, you talk about it as if it's some large celebrity grandiose status. And for me, I feel like it's just going to work and doing what I do. And I'm really happy I can make other people happy. And I'm really glad everybody knows what it is. But I never feel like that. I never feel like, you know, like movie star or that people know who I am. The fact that you guys are here at all wanting to meet me, I'm like, why are you here? It's just me. <laughs> I just work like you guys do. And I, you know, happen to get a great cartoon that everybody likes. And I'm really glad it went well. And I, I hope they do another one. Um, so I, I, I never feel like that. Like, what was it like to be in a huge project? I don't know. <laughs> I go home and pick up my dog's poo just like everybody else's. And <laughs> do the dishes. <laughs> I hope that answered the question. I think that did more than answer my question. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Debbie. Nice to meet you again. You too. Uh, let's see. My question is, uh, how was your experience working on Final Fantasy X? 
Well, uh, the guy who directs it, Jamie Mortallaro, is one of um, Ian and I's best friends. And <clears throat> so I never know what Jamie's going to throw my way. And when he calls up and says, I need you to come in and do some of your little voices. OK. And I never know what it is. And so I know I did faith in that as well. And that one I think I auditioned for. But the most fun I had was doing the, come on, help me out, guys. What are the names of those little bitty fly characters I do? Cups? Uh, hiccups? No. Kupos. 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 That's it. Doing the Kupo, 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 Kupo. Those were super fun. And I've, I've had a lot of Final Fantasy sessions. One of them was a looping session, you know, where you're, you're in this high, big sound stage with a lot of other people and the main stuff's going on and you're flitting around doing voices for the little things that are flying around. And then uh, the ones where I did Faith, and that lasts about 20 minutes, and it goes on for 20 years. So it's easy to forget all this stuff, and I have to go back and see the scenes, because we never see the scenes. And we're not allowed to know the story. We're not allowed to see the script. When we go in to do a video game, they give us our lines. The director tells us what just happened and what's going to just happen and the voice that you're going to do the character, and, and that's all you get. So I never know, you know, and they don't even give you the name of the video game. They're very elusive, and we don't know till it comes out. Like with, with Monster High, I didn't know what it was called. It was Meadow Hearts, I guess. But I was amazed at how many fans there are for Final Fantasy, and there's just so many different chapters, I guess, iterations. Which one was I in? Uh, ten. What? Ten? Ten, yeah. See? There were nine I didn't even know about. <laughs> <laughs> but I like the... Uh, I just made a new video game demo. I think, it, I think I just had it put up on my YouTube channel. If you guys want to see my new... Did you see it yet? I saw my that. video game demo I just put up on the YouTube channel? Goody. My friend Joe put that up for me. He runs the... Uh, What's that word that starts with a D that's like Facebook? Uh, that's like... Um, Discord? Yeah, Discord. The new Discord, Jimmy Neutron, Mark DiCarlo group. Uh, the guy, Joe, who runs that, uh, helped me put that video up on my YouTube channel. This is more information than you want, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I answered the question. What did you say? Oh, no, you did great. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for playing it. Hi, I'm Bunny. Um, Hi, I love orange and red, orange <laughs> and you. pink. I think it's a great choice. <laughs> thank I like you, to me wear too. orange and pink. <laughs> I think I got orange and pink on too. Oh, I love your shirt. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to know, is mm -hmm. there like a really small, like tiny role that you did that you kind of accredit to like a bunch of people wanting to work with you that kind of like led to like your big break maybe? Sorry, it's so hard to understand. Sorry. <laughs> Just kind of scream. All right. Um, is there a really tiny role that you did that you kind of accredit to a bunch of people wanting to work with you? Like you did this one really small thing and then a bunch of people like came to you and was like, we want you to do so and so. Yeah, here's a funny story. Um, so Mickey, the loop, how are we on time, Chris Tim? We're good. We're good. So, the people who call you into loop on a film, it's called the looping coordinator, the ADR super supervisor. And they bring in a group of people and you do the extra voices. So on Toy Story and on you know, many of the Pixar films, uh, Mickey would call us in and she'd say, and there's 13 of us, you know, Bob Bergen and um, Bill Farmer and Lorraine Newman and I'm gonna burp again, uh, a little <laughs> one. So this is Jess Harnell, just a star studded, I guess this voiceover uh, goes all in one room for eight hours and they say look at this cue this is them pulling you out of the uh, alien machine and here's the uh, the store Pizza Planet Buzz just landed here and you know there's normal pizza stuff going on so they had us all go up to the mic and do the pizza lady uh, so if you listen in the back of Pizza Planet they picked me for that one the um, <clears throat> uh, Waldman party of six your pizza's ready and you can hear me do it when the principals are working. So 22 years later, I get a call from my agent. Disney wanted me to voice one of the voices in the Pizza Planet ride. 
and they wanted that same voice from that movie 22 years ago. So they called the ADR supervisor, Mickey, and they said, who did that? So she looked on her records and she said, that was Debbie. So Disney, um, it's a different department, the one that casts ride voices. So I went in and did the voice 22 years later from that tiny little moment of the day. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. So now everybody, and plus the, the alien voice too, you know, that was just seven of us in front of the mic going, pick me, pick me, the claw. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> and so I, I had no idea that the aliens were gonna be like a thing. So again, that was one of those little things that kind of exploded on me and it was happy. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Great question. Hello there, how are you? <laughs> Hi, I absolutely love the jacket. It looks beautiful on you. Um, Can you get really close to the mic and scream? I love the jacket, it looks really good on you. Oh, my Jimmy Neutron jacket. Yes. I have so many and of both. these crew jackets. I never know what to do with them. I pulled it out of the box. You can always frame the jackets. If they don't fit you, you can frame them. People do frame clothes. They do what? They frame their clothes. Oh, yeah, but I'd need real estate wall space to do it. It's all filled with cells and cartoons. Oh, yeah, true. Shoot. You're, you're right about that. <laughs> okay. I cut, up, up, and cut it up into dish towels. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I did want to say that before my question, I did draw a character of mine who I actually interpreted your voice to. I can see you acting her very well. She's a high school teen, but she sounds like literally Pinkie Pie from MLP. Oh my and gosh. I could see you acting her so well. Thank you. Well, I hope that you create a uh, pilot for her and put her on YouTube I'm and then email me might. and let me voice her. I might do it soon. You need to do it. That's how stuff starts. I mean, look at Miraculous <laughs> Ladybug, right? True. That just started as a silly little YouTube thing and it exploded a little bit. You're right about that. <laughs> that's the way of the future. Wait, that's a line. That's the way of the future. <laughs> that sounds familiar, I don't know. <laughs> okay, my question is from one voice actor to another. Was there any particular project of yours that you were somewhat nervous for, like you didn't really have a voice like immediately in your head of that character? They had to really like sum it down? Um, yeah, I will tell you a story that happened about two months ago. Um, they called me over to Mark Grau Studios to, because they, they know my husband's British, so sometimes they, th they throw British auditions at, or jobs at me, even though my husband laughs at me. He says, it's a pretty bad accent, girl. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm still working on my British accent, Yeah, it's a too. tough one, because there's so many different ones. So I go in, and uh, they said, it's a little British boy. I said, oh, all right, I can do that one. And they said, no, wait, he's, um, no, first they said, it's a little boy, and I'm like, yeah, I can do the British boy. Oh, it sounds like Jimmy, doesn't it? And then they said, <laughs> wait, he's British. But wait, he's, he's actually 600 years old. So he's more grown up, and he's more British, and he's a boy. And I'm like, oh, well, that's not exactly what I had pictured in my head at all. So it took me a while. You spend about 15 minutes with the uh, engineer and the, the producer, the director, finding that voice. And then after they find the voice, they're like, that's the one. They record that, and they call that's your ref, your, your reference voice, mm -hmm. and the engineer holds onto that file. And then every time you do a line for that voice and you feel like you've lost it, you ask the engineer to throw the ref at you to play the reference voice for you, and then um, you kind of can get back into it. Yeah. But that was a pretty nerve-wracking. I thought, they are gonna tell me to go home. <laughs> like I that. have um, published a few of my own director's cuts of some of my voices. Mm -hmm. And there was one time where I was doing a Teen Titans Go kind of thing. I was doing Teen Titans. And there was a random little cameo of just like, just a little kid, like a little boy, who was an Aussie. And I've never done an Aussie. And <laughs> I was trying to figure it out and I'm like, you know what? Let's just do an Animal Planet kind of voice. Everybody likes those kind of voices. And I managed finally to get that voice after like, two hours of uh, trying to get that voice. Yeah, so the accents are things that we have to work on as voice actors on our own and yep. come to the table with it and advertise whether we can actually do it or not. Like, I really stay away from a German accent, um, a Norwegian accent. I just, I feel like I'm not, 
competitive in it, so I don't mm -hmm. bother. Do you have a voice agent? Um, no, but the person who I tend to go to with my voice stuff is actually my friend, Liz. Cool. Since they are still kind of semi-teaching me how to do accents. Hi, Liz. Hey, you guys. Well, good luck to you in all that. <laughs> Thank you. Voice? Huh? I study dialogues. Oh, excellent. Yeah, that's a great thing to study. They're getting me back into the British accents. There's so many of them. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, excellent. They're trying to teach me Cockney, and I can't not get it. Oh, you can. Just stick with it. Stick with it. You'll sure. get it. Watch a lot of Game of Thrones. I'm sorry. Right. Um, I doubt Nabby is what I meant. I know what you meant. That's like Tim and Chris. Oh, five minutes. Okay, let's get Thank to the so next much. question. Thanks. Hi. By the way, after this, I do have two autograph signings today. So I have a lot more pictures, and I have my voiceover book, and they'll be with me at the signings. Hi, I'm Sam. Hi, Sam. Hey, I was wondering, what's like the longest take you've ever done? The longest take? Probably a Monster High take where I wanted to throttle the director around his neck. <laughs> and after a few uh, redirects, sometimes I just say to the director, just do it for me. How do you think it should sound? Because it's really hard to say with your words how you want someone else to say something without giving them what's called in acting is a line read. Like when a director at all costs will try not to give an actor a line read because they think we don't like it. Honest to God, I would have preferred it than doing 300 takes of that one line because <laughs> I just couldn't get it the way he liked to get it. Um, but I don't think there have been any, um, oh, there was one where I got whiplash. I was doing this video game, I don't remember which one, but they wanted this character to do a backflip. And there's noises that go along with any action, all those choreography I, um, actions make noise. So it was this, <coughs> no, and then a double flip. <coughs> And I was standing up, and they just kept me at I must have done 200 takes. And the next day, I had whiplash. Dang. It's, it's not, and I was sweating. I mean, and in some of these, we were doing a, um, what was it? S -s 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 oh, I'm forgetting the name. What's that name of that cartoon I'm in with those little Smurfs? The Smurfs. And um, we were doing all the, the Smurfs in the forest, and um, Fred Tattasher was up doing um, one kind of monster voice, and it was very physical. And with looping voices, you don't have to like be in front of the mic because they have a mic six feet away, so you can wiggle. And Fred was very physical, and then he fainted because you're breathing so much to get this same action over and over again, they want three or four or five takes of the same action, and it can be <laughs> Do it again. Okay. And it's exhausting, and you can get a migraine, and you can run out of air, and you turn red, and it's, it's really hard, so you have to be in good shape to do voiceover. I don't even know. If, did I answer that question at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank Any other you. questions? I think we're out of time, but, but Tim, Chris, Sam, give them the 10-4, the 911. All right. So thank you guys for coming out. Um, we will be over in the TELUS 360 room, just across the uh, parking garage at 1.30 for autographs. And then that'll be about an hour and a half. Then we'll have a short break, and then we'll be back in there again till about 4.30 doing autographs. Yes, and I would love it if you guys would um, indulge my social media. I I passed 1.1 million on TikTok this um, last month, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I would love it if you would uh, follow me on TikTok and Insta and, and all the other things, Twitter, and I'm not on that one that starts with a D yet. What do you call it again? Discord. Discord. But uh, there's a lot of different Discord servers that you would okay, join. Okay, well, I'm not there yet anyway. <laughs> but you can watch the YouTubes and like it and subscribe, and especially the TikTok. And thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. I hope you all have a wonderful day and stay safe. Thanks for coming out, everyone. Thank you. This is Bo Billingsley, and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Be sure to like and subscribe, but more importantly, have fun and follow your fandom.